Podcast. Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of InvestorIdeas.com Podcast, looking at cannabis news, stocks to watch, as well as insights from thought leaders and experts. In today's podcast, I interview Craig Benke and Mike Reagan, both equity research analysts at MJ Biz Daily's Investor Intelligence, where we discuss their recent report, Investment Assessment North America Vape Market, and how investors and businesses can weather this storm and even benefit from the current slump in the vape sector. Hey, this is uh, Craig Benke and Mike Reagan. We're the two equity analysts here at uh, Investor Intelligence at MJ Biz Daily. Uh, it's great to be able to talk to both of you guys today. So could you maybe just give a brief industry background as well as how that led you to maybe to MJ Biz Daily? Sure. So I joined MJ Biz Daily in July of this year, and I had spent the uh, about 20, 21 years uh, prior in the investment management industry as an equity analyst and then later in my career as a portfolio manager, uh, managing two growth funds at USAA Asset Management. And um, so I had specialized in a couple of sectors of coverage uh, during my tenure on the, uh, the buy side of the business as an equity analyst and PM, and they were pretty regulated businesses um, in healthcare, um, also in telecom, and then in uh, consumer staples. Um, and I wound up coming to MJ Biz Daily because I thought that the, uh, the cannabis sector was one that was so ripe for not just a couple of years of uh, tremendous growth and a lot of uh, interesting opportunity on the investment side, but I, I think it's a, a secular trend that has 10, 15, 20 more years of incredible growth to go. And I do think there is uh, a niche to be had for somebody uh, coming from a traditional investment management background and applying a lot of those uh, tech, techniques and processes to uh, doing fundamental bottom-up due diligence of cannabis-related companies. So um, I decided to join MJ Biz Daily and start doing that type of work here. And, uh, and Taylor, this is Mike Regan. Um, my guess is actually pretty similar to Craig's. Uh, I've got about 20 years uh, of experience doing long short equity investing uh, and fundamental analysis, mostly at hedge funds uh, such as Rubay Capital, Hawkshaw Capital, and Copper Arch Capital. Uh, and I've basically been a generalist at most of those funds, looking at consumer, industrials, and energy, um, and among, but pretty much most sectors. Because uh, basically, as I see it, like Craig, I see sort of a once in a lifetime shift uh, for an existing but outlawed industry that will ultimately be a disruptive consumer product with a standard agricultural and industrial supply chain and you know consumer facing brands and distribution at the end of the day. Uh, so I hope to bring that you know the, the experience covering all those more traditional industries to uh, the cannabis sector. Yeah, it sounds like both of you have at least a much more uh, long-term view of the industry than I think a lot of people do in these days. It's such a rapidly expanding industry. Most people are looking in terms of six months to two years as far as how they're assessing the industry. It's good to hear that people are focusing on this as a 20 you know, and upwards industry, which is obviously is going to be. It's not going away anytime soon. We agree, yes. So I'd like to get right into the investment assessment of the North American vape market article that was recently released uh, through MJ Biz Investor Intelligence. There's a lot of negative press, obviously, surrounding the vape industry right now, especially in the U.S. market. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that article that you were both involved in and maybe where you see some of the positives as well as some of the clear red flags facing the vape market right now? So one thing I want to, to make sure we clarify is that uh, when we did mention uh, some companies in this report, and uh, that was on page three, um, we had cited several companies that had meaningful exposure either to uh, the vape devices or the consumables, the cartridges, and that was Green Lane Holdings, Tilt Holdings, Cushco, and Slang Worldwide. They have anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of their uh, business in uh, the, the vape segment of the market, but I wanted to make something very clear is that none of those companies have been implicated in any way in the actual crisis that's going on. And I wanted to make clear that we believe, and the, the research from the CDC has shown that the overwhelming majority 
of the cases where people have uh, been sickened by use of these products, 90% uh, of the people, they've obtained either their, uh, their devices or their consumables um, not from licensed stores and licensed providers that operate in the legal market. We really think this is a black market issue where uh, hundreds of individuals around the country can simply buy the devices and the cartridges and buy all of the ingredients, the THC oil, the thickening agents, the cutting agents, all of those things, and literally manufacture black market devices in their garage or in their basement. Um, and we believe that those uh, operators, you can't call them companies, those operators are ultimately going to be found out as the source of the overwhelming majority of the issues that are occurring right now. So we don't want to uh, cast any negative light on companies that are uh, doing a, legally providing these products because we really don't think those are uh, causing any of these illnesses. I really appreciate that clarification because that's something I'm well aware of as well is that these aren't the actual legal companies, but this is, again, that gray and black market area. But the negative press still, unfortunately, does impact these companies, which is more what I'd like to have you guys bring up and, and discuss. You know, sure. I mean, clearly, uh, many of the companies have, that have that exposure have uh, have taken, you know, declines of practically 25% uh, before. And then in the case of uh, at least Cushco, uh, they were then further knocked down when they had they continued an equity offering that they had already planned for the fall um, that they needed to basically fully fund their business plan, but they had to do it when the stock was already down 25%, uh, which ends up the stock uh, down even further. So it's this it's interesting for them in that this crisis that has very little to do with them has you know has compounded in terms of uh, making their funding that much more difficult and basically coming at sort of the worst time for it. Absolutely. So could you talk maybe about the potential, I know it was mentioned again in that investment assessment, North American Date Market article, um, that there is an upside to this for some of these companies and there is an upside to investors as well if they're prepared to pay attention to the right information and also be patient within the industry. Could you talk more to that? Right. So some of the companies that we think stand to benefit, um, there are a couple of areas that we think over time will come into a lot more focus due to this particular crisis. And one of the first ones, uh, things that we think happens in the industry is a lot more focus on seed to sale tracking within the industry. And there um, are a couple of companies that are involved in that. One of them is called Acurna. Um, there's another one that is called uh, THC Biotrack or Biotrack THC. Um, they're also involved in seed to sale tracking. Um, we think that becomes a, a much more important part of the legal uh, uh, supply chain where customers and also regulatory agencies are going to be able to double check everything along uh, every step of the way through the supply chain. We also think that um, perhaps um, increased tamper-proof packaging or something that has to do with the packaging becomes a lot more prevalent as we go forward. And there are a couple of companies, like Cushco actually is, is negatively impacted by this. However, they do have um, a lot of uh, packaging revenues, which they could stand to benefit in a particular way if tamper-proof packaging or um, holograms that need to be on packages uh, get employed on a lot more of the, uh, the packaging. So there's, um, there are several companies that we think in the long run uh, could benefit. And then also um, just the fact that if we do find out, and we think this will be the case, it's our opinion, um, that the issues are from the illicit operators in the market, we think that is a, a fantastic uh, driver of people who had been consuming in the illicit market um, to perhaps funnel them into the legal markets and to, to really drive home the importance that if you're going to be vaping, you really do need to uh, acquire your supplies and devices from licensed and legal vendors. You know, because the stakes are so high. Look, if I buy a fake Rolex watch, 
um, in Times Square, New York, maybe I'm out $150, but if I buy, you know, fake vaping uh, supplies and devices, I, I could be out, you know, my health or my life. You know, the consequences are so great that we feel that ultimately it does drive more consumers into the legal market. That's an interesting perspective to hear just because this is a very difficult industry when you're looking at it as there is still a black market and gray market that drastically affects the not only, again, the actual like consumer basis, but also the news cycle that's surrounding this industry. We already saw that with CanTrust and now we're seeing this with the vape market as well, um, that you know, any exposure to the black market within the industry can be massively impactful to the legal industry. Do you think that this will not only push more consumers towards the legal industry, but also possibly force regulators as well as, um, you know, different, different F the FDA or different bodies of government to really invest in uh, actually enforcing a lot of these rules that have been put in place and also uh, speeding up the process of fully regulating this market so that way there isn't these issues consistently plaguing it? Well, I think that would be the, uh, it's always risky, I guess, to predict what governments are going to do, but that would be the, the logical way to protect the most number of customers is to provide legal regulated products that are trackable and are, you know, don't have chemicals in them that will kill you uh, versus, you know, buying illicit things, uh, you know, from the illicit market where the incentive is to cut it as much as possible and, um, you know, basically the, the the illicit operator makes the most money by giving you as little as possible of the actual product. Um, it's a, another question of whether governments will actually do that or do the knee-jerk ban, um, you know, sort of ban all vapes, uh, in which case that basically hurts the legal operators and only helps, it only funnels people back to the illicit market. So, I mean, that's, that's sort of a separate question, and that's basically the risk for some of these companies. Because um, what's most interesting is that unlike CanTrust, these companies were not doing anything, uh, as far as we can tell, illicitly. They're just selling their normal legal products, and it's the illicit market that's that's then having the knock-on effect on their multiples uh, and, and their business. And um, but they're not actually doing anything themselves. And in that regulated scenario, they should actually benefit uh, from a shift from illicit to to regulated. Yeah. You know, Taylor, one thing that, um, you know, from my experience investing in the healthcare industry for the past two decades, you know, which is a, an incredibly highly regulated industry, um, I guess to summarize it, I don't have a tremendous amount of confidence that federal and state regulatory authorities uh, will get the, the reaction and the regulations right on the first try. I believe that the government regulators will eventually come up with uh, regulations that work for consumers and the industry um, after they've exhausted all other options. <laughs> so, meaning, you know, I think they'll they'll fumble around and there will be multiple iterations. The the first set of regulations will be uh, will be Byzantine and probably um, restrictive to both consumers. Um, and the companies involved, but over time, um, as they, as companies and consumers uh, survive under those regulations, I do believe they will be changed over time and will will ultimately get to a place that is productive for both the industry and consumers. But given that it's government regulators at work, I don't think it, it magically happens in three to 12 months. I think it's a multi-year process before we get to the promised land. So when we are looking at this vape industry then right now, it, you know, obviously the legal vape industry, I don't care about the illicit market, but um, when we're looking at that, where do you see then the long-term impacts of this current sort of news cycle that's focusing on this? And how do you see the vape industry sort of surviving or lasting over the next few years then until we get proper regulations in place? Well, you know, once again, it's incredibly difficult um, to predict any of that with accuracy. However, I, I, I do think that it's incredibly difficult to, to completely stop a form of consumption that consumers 
enjoy and they want to engage in. So I don't think that um, the 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 vaping form factor or that method of consumption, I don't think that's going away completely down to zero. However, when you look at the percentage of recreational cannabis sales that um, it is for several of the, um, like California, Nevada, Colorado, Washington, kind of several of the more uh, progressive states in terms of cannabis laws, now, it's anywhere from the um, low double digits all the way up to 25% of consumption. Now, if that dropped down to 5%, yeah, that's an incredibly difficult scenario uh, for the vape industry um, as a whole. Uh, but we don't see that it drops off that far. Yes, it, it might lessen in popularity because of the, the background noise of that risk, um, but, you know, if if you've been doing this as long as uh, Mike and I have, um, there are multiple instances that we can think of where something tremendously negative happened with a, a product or a service. Um, and 12 to 18 months, maybe 36 months later, consumer behavior, when you look at the data and consumption patterns and the sales, you wouldn't even know that that particular event had happened, and, and I'll go really far back in history here because it involves deaths, is that, uh, actually, I believe it was in the mid-'80s, um, Tylenol uh, had been tainted with cyanide, and yeah, it caused some deaths, and it didn't kill the product. Um, what the industry did was get engaged um, with a lot of consumer education about tamper-proof packaging, and, you know, two to three years later, um, sales of the product were just fine. I mean, a, another one that happened in uh, in retail uh, over the past, I would say, two to three years is the restaurant chain Chipotle had multiple outbreaks of incredibly um, serious uh, illnesses that were brought on by consuming some of their food because it had been tainted. Um, yet, you know, a couple of years later, sales at Chipotle are doing just fine. The restaurant chain is still in business. It was just a short-term hit to the business. But if consumers like the product, they like engaging in that form factor, we don't think it's going away. Well, one thing to, to follow up with that, that's the question of the business and the consumption. Then when you get down to the level of the companies, you really have to look at the capital structure to see if the equity can survive you know, the, the, the winter of the, of the crisis, essentially. And that's where coming down is looking at essentially the balance sheet, how much debt versus how much cash uh, does the company have comes down to whether the equity survives. So the business may be fine, but the debt, if the crisis is too long, then the debt holders effectively own the company. Uh, I mean, and, and just in looking at just a couple companies, you know, Kushko has about 20 million of debt. So depending on the length of the crisis, they're going to have to come up with some creative ways to finance that if they can't, if the business doesn't turn around or this doesn't, uh, can, uh, if this takes too long. Uh, and, you know, in contrast, Valens uh, is a company up in Canada and they have that cash of about 66 million, as I remember. Uh, so they would, you know, and they haven't been affected by this at all either on a fundamental basis. But if there is any, any, um, you know, any delay from regulators, uh, acting potentially in the, not in the interest of the consumers and banning the legal aspects of the market, you know, having the stronger balance sheet allows the equity to survive to the other side. You know, in the case of Chipotle and and also with Tylenol, they both had pretty strong balance sheets as well, as I remember. Yeah. Um, so that comes down to when you're analyzing the business, you have to focus on the capital structure uh, to see what's left over for you as an equity holder. You both raised a couple of interesting points there. The one I'd like to get into that you just actually mentioned was Valance, how they're sort of outside that market. Um, this seems like it seems to be mainly affecting just U.S.-based companies. This is still an international industry right now. So are you seeing that there could be you know, other companies that have maybe a more spread out portfolio? They're not strictly focused on vape products that could actually see a big advantage of this by removing a vast majority of their niche small competition in a lot of the U.S. states. Is that a possibility for, for a lot of those bigger a Canadian LP or an international company that has, you know, vape products, but also dried flour 
and edibles and other product SKUs so they can sort of last through this and then a lot of their vape competition disappears overnight? You know, that's interesting. I, I, would, I would agree with that wholeheartedly if the companies that sell vape products um, within the U.S., if they actually manufactured the products themselves or there was, uh, there was incredible brand loyalty or if there was intellectual property um, in certain devices and they truly were differentiated from each other, um, and, you know, kind of like if, if Apple and, uh, and Microsoft, if Apple went away tomorrow, you know, that's, they have a lot of IP and nobody can just rise up uh, within a couple of months and replace Apple and all of the intellectual property around their operating system. However, in my research in, in this particular uh, segment of the business, you know, it was amazing. We found out that uh, the overwhelming majority of all vape devices and a lot of the cartridges, they are manufactured by just a small handful of companies in China. And uh, the, the region within China escapes me right now, but literally there are a small handful of manufacturers within a, within a 100 square mile region where likely 99% of all of these devices are manufactured. And the, the U.S. businesses, all they do is they either buy straight from the Chinese factory in whatever form factor is produced, um, which is white labeling, or they private label and they give these Chinese manufacturers um, certain specifications in terms of the materials they use or the shape or the size or small nuances that they can change. So even if some of the U.S businesses um, did, quote unquote, go out of business uh, because of a ban, you or I literally could start a vape pen company uh, within 48 hours by simply uh, logging onto Alibaba or contacting some of these Chinese manufacturers. And within two to six weeks, we could have orders of tens of thousands of vape pens with our branded logos. We could have them in a warehouse ready to be shipped out. So if companies, some companies do get put out of business, it's incredibly easy for somebody else to just step in and, and get a vape business up and running incredibly quickly. Yeah, so on that angle, it's more points to the power then of the, the end distributor, the retailer, or, and the brands, uh, if, if there is any brand that can build up uh, basically brand trust with the end customers, because it's one thing SaaS is they can uh, then shift over to vape from from flower and gain that consumer trust. It, it's less about, you know, there's exactly like Craig said, there's an Apple, and once you take away Apple, Microsoft captures the rest of the market in this. Uh, the one, but in terms of your question about is which company sort of universally benefit, um, it would seem that this, if there's more regulations on tracking the actual products and gaining consumer trust or ensuring that the products that are going to be vaped are actually what you're buying. That would be, again, the feed-to-sale companies, um, which there's basically three, and one is private. There's Akerna and uh, Biotrack THC, which is actually uh, publicly traded under Helix TCS. Uh, and I know with Akerna, they actually now have a new system partnering with Solo Sciences where uh, if a um, producer wants to, they can put a like a UPC type code, like a little uh, scannable code label on the package and the end consumer can scan that on an app with their smartphone and then it'll pop up, yes, this is a legit XYZ vape cartridge and not from, you know, the back of some guy's trunk with the same, you know, fake uh, photo on it of the same brand. So it'll allow branded companies to actually directly let the consumer confirm that what they're buying is actually what they think they're buying. Uh, so that's not at this point, um, you know, I think they've just launched that, that uh, potential product, but that hasn't actually, at least to my knowledge, been actually implemented by anyone at this point. Uh, so that's one that has more, you know, the secular trend of more tracking and gaining consumer trust benefits those companies. Um, other than obviously those tracking and seed to sale uh, sort of companies and then also the packaging 
element, are you noticing that some of the companies that have stayed out of the vape industry or not affected by it, are they seeing a benefit as well or an up trend? Uh, because again, consumers are, we're seeing the sales drop in vape products all around. So now obviously those sales have to go somewhere. Are you noticing that the edibles or the flower-based companies are now having an upwards trend because people are returning to their products or now considering their products as a safer and more reliable option? Yeah, so what we've seen in the data is that um, as the share of vape has come down, it really has been spread uh, pretty diversely amongst uh, the other form factors that people are choosing to consume THC. Now, obviously, dried flour is one um, that has uh, picked up a little bit of market share, but between uh, edibles um, and you have multiple forms of edibles, you have um, actually kind of bakery or savory sweets, and then you have uh, the gummies and things like that, and then you have uh, tinctures and oils, and you have uh, multiple form factors, um, we have seen consumption kind of push into multiple areas. Dry flour is the, the one that has benefited the most, but it, consumer behavior on the legal side hasn't really changed all that much. Um, really, the, the biggest impact, I think, is in the illicit market, and um, unfortunately, we don't have the detailed data that we get from services like Headset, which give us point of sale data on a daily basis throughout four states for the entire cannabis industry. So we can track so many different things. Now on the illicit side, we can't do that, but we haven't seen any type of meaningful and significant dollar value increase in one particular product in the, uh, the cannabis space because of this crisis. So it's a pretty even spread then across the industry. That's good to know. Yeah, it seems to be that way so far. So I guess just in final thoughts then, um, as again, this has massively affected the, the vape industry and there are some companies that are going to be having some issues over the next coming months, uh, as again, people wait for different regulations to come out or wait to hear on if there is going to be a ban, as I know that's been mentioned, but seems still unlikely. What's the best thing investors can do over the next coming months to not only uh, stay out of the sort of firing squad of, of this affecting their portfolios, but also in benefiting and really, uh, really getting some positives out of what's changing in the industry? What should they be aware of and what should they be really, uh, really looking out for as far as negatives or positives? So one of the things, um, obviously, that we think investors need to know is what percentage of a, a company that you're invested in or hold shares in, um, what percentage of their business um, is either vape device or vape consumable related? That is the first cut, is you want to understand your direct exposure uh, to this particular negative part of the industry. Now, I, I think the positives that could, uh, in, that could, some companies uh, could pick up on over the uh, the next six to 18 months. I think that happens so slowly. It's not like there's an immediate opportunity that XYZ stock is going to have a significant increase in their business in the next six months, specifically because of this crisis. So the next thing you have to do um, is if you think that there is going to be a little bit of a nuclear winter here where um, perhaps sales of a particular form factor could uh, continue to suffer some, uh, some attrition in terms of market share, what you really want to do is understand the companies you're invested in. Um, are they profitable now? Um, are they burning cash? How much capital do they need over the next 12 to 24 months in order to execute their stated business plan? Because perhaps it's been helped out by the, uh, by the vape crisis, or it might be a completely standalone issue. But over the past, I would say, four to six weeks, we have seen um, a tremendous shift in the nature of capital raising and financing that is going on uh, within the cannabis sector that uh, financing has become far more difficult to attain. 
the, the rates that you have to pay in order to achieve that financing has shot up significantly. So what that really means is that if, if I'm an investor, I really need to know which of my companies right now, if they had no more access to financing over the next 12 to 24 months, are they profitable? Could they survive? Could they execute their business plan? So I would look at how much cash they're burning and that you can just, a, a quick cut of that is the uh, operating cash flow right off the cash flow statement. Um, and then take a look uh, through some of their last conference call transcripts or in their uh, published quarterly and annual financials to see if management actually puts out any guidance in terms of how much CapEx they need to execute their business strategy over the next 12 to 24 months. Another really good source for that, you can go to the company's websites and they typically all have an investor presentation in PDF or PowerPoint format, which will walk you through their business case, how they plan to spend money, expand either stores or territory. Get your arms around that particular story for each of the companies you're invested in and ask yourself, all right, if they need a lot of capital, you know, do I think they can raise it? Or if they're profitable now, I think that's your best place to, to actually be safe and to maybe take some shelter from what could be a little bit of a nuclear winter. Well, thank you so much. That's been a really great insight from both of you today. And uh, I really appreciate your, your analysis on the, uh, on the vape problem that's going on right now. Excellent. Thank you, Teller. Thank you so much. Much. Yes, a pleasure being on your podcast. We really appreciate uh, you taking the time with us today. Once again, that was Craig Benke and Mike Reagan, both equity research analysts at MJ Biz Daily's Investor Intelligence. To find out more about MJ Biz Daily and their Investor Intelligence Conference, as well as their Investor Intelligence sector, you can click the links attached in the article. That's all for today's podcast. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. That's all for today's podcast. Podcast is now a certified word trademark on the blockchain through Cognate Incorporated CM certification. InvestorIdeas.com podcasts are also available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play Music, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, and TuneIn. If you'd like to be a guest or sponsor of this podcast, please contact InvestorIdeas.com. Investor Ideas reminds all listeners to read our disclaimers and disclosures on the InvestorIdeas.com website. And this podcast is not an endorsement to buy products or services or securities. Investors are reminded that all investments involve risk and possible loss of investment. Investor Ideas does not condone the use of cannabis except where permissible by law. Our site does not possess, distribute, or sell cannabis products.